Grable, would you please stand for reading of God's word? This morning we continue our series, Sermon on the Mount with Beatitudes. So I'll begin reading Matthew 5, verse 1. And seeing the crowds, he went up the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. This is the word of the Lord. Please be seated. The psychologist Abraham Maslow theorized that all human beings are driven fundamentally by basic desires, basic needs that unless they are not met, we cannot fully achieve our greatest dreams. Basic needs like food, water, shelter, and air. The theory is known as Maslow's hierarchy of needs, and you don't have to hear about it to really recognize that there's something about this that is true. That look, you can have whatever dream that you want in this life, but if you can't breathe, you will do everything you can to get oxygen and put everything else aside. If you've ever been truly hungry, truly hungry, you know in those moments that it's difficult to think about anything else, that you become consumed with that hunger and you put everything else off until you can eat and find food. That if you've ever been parched, your mouth becomes dry and you become thirsty, you focus on that thirst. It doesn't matter whatever it is that you want to become or do, whatever task that you hope to accomplish in that particular moment. No, in that moment, you go and find something to drink. Jesus said that there is an even greater need, an even more fundamental need than food or water. He called it a hunger and a thirst for righteousness. What I want us to see this morning is that Jesus is offering true satisfaction to all who hunger and thirst for righteousness. I want you to see that he is the only one who can satisfy our greatest need. It's the first thing I want you to know. I want you to know that you and I have been called to the righteousness of God. I want you to look with me. Matthew 5, verse 6. This morning we're looking at the fourth beatitude. I want you to listen to the words of Jesus. Jesus said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Now, if we're going to understand what it means to hunger and thirst for righteousness, we need to first understand what Jesus means by righteousness. And righteousness is one of those churchy words. It's one of those words that gets kind of thrown around Christian circles, and odds are if you've grown up around Christianity, whether you're a Christian or not this morning, you probably have some amount of baggage that's attached to that word. That when you hear the word righteousness, you think of something stuffy, something cold, and maybe in your mind you even have a picture of a self-righteous person, someone who is using the word righteousness in judgment of another person 
all the while they're a hypocrite. And so to begin, I want you to know this, that the word righteousness simply means rightness. When you hear the word righteousness, it's referring to the way things ought to be. The way things God always intended them to be at creation. So when you hear the word righteousness, I don't want you to think of some self-righteous, hypocritical, judgmental Christian. I want you to think of God. Because God is the only one who truly is righteous by that definition. He is the standard of what is right in the world. His character literally is righteous. That is to say, God is right. And if you want to know what right is, what does it mean to be right? We have to begin with the character of God. The Psalms describe righteousness really in three ways, okay? The first way is a righteousness before God, that we would be seen right before a holy and righteous God, okay? Uh, we see this in Psalm 7, verse 11. The psalmist says, God is a righteous judge. This kind of righteousness is associated with God's judgment, that he is righteous in all the ways that he might rule in judgment over us as his people. And what I want you to know this morning is really good news, that God is righteous both in his wrath over sin but he is also righteous and right in his grace and mercy for sinners. It's the first way that we talk about righteousness. The psalmist also, though, talk about a second way to think about righteousness. Righteousness within ourselves, that we, as human beings made in the image of God, are now called to be righteous. We're called to be right. Before the fall, we were made righteous. We were right. We were the way that we were supposed to be. And we'll talk about this more in a minute, but now after the fall, that righteousness has been completely broken. And so it's difficult for us to comprehend this, but the idea is that we are called to be righteous in the way that we live. We see this in Psalm 119, 137. Righteous are you, O Lord, and right are your rules. To say that God is righteous is not just to say that his character is right but that all that he has commanded us to be is right. And that's what we see in the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus is giving us a vision of what right looks like in the kingdom of God. The right way that we are to live with one another before even our enemies. The way that we're called to love them. The way that we're rightly to live within marriage the way that we are rightly to operate in the world around us, which leads to the third way that the psalmists talk about righteousness. And that's a righteousness that we see in the world around us. This kind of righteousness is often associated with justice. That the world around us, all of creation, is right. But I think if we're honest, it doesn't take long to look around the world and recognize there's something not quite right with it. This kind of righteousness is talked about Psalm 89, 14. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Steadfast love and faithfulness go before you. I want you to listen again to what the psalmist just said. That righteousness and justice and love are the foundation of God's throne. In other words, wherever God is on the throne, wherever he is establishing his righteousness, things are being made right. That is the kind of righteousness that Jesus is calling us to. When he says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. It's the kind of righteousness that comes with the kingdom of God. Now this is incredibly important because you and I live in a world and during an age where everyone around us is trying to redefine righteousness apart from his kingdom. Righteousness 
as now being redefined apart from God. So that actually now what is unrighteous before God is now seen as righteous. And those who follow God and his kingdom are now seen as unrighteous through the eyes of the world. Because our world is attempting to build a kingdom without the king. Greg Epstein is the head chaplain of Harvard University. He also happens to be an atheist. I want you to think about that for just a second. An atheist is the head chaplain at Harvard. And you say, well, how can that happen? That happens when we attempt to build righteousness apart from the kingdom of God. And he wrote a book called Good Without God. I want you to listen to what he says. Any form of goodness must come without God. And any meaning our lives are to have must be a meaning we create. So here's the question. If there is no God, there is no one on the throne, there is no judge on the judgment bench, then who decides what is right and wrong? If there is no God, no authority, and no kingdom, who decides what is righteous? I think Greg Epstein tells us, we do. We create righteousness for ourselves. And if you've studied human history at any length, you see where this story ends. As the final verse in the book of Judges tells us, that in those days, there was no king in Israel. And so everyone did what is right in their own eyes. You say, well, why would people try to build righteousness apart from God? Well, here's the reason. Because if God is the standard of righteousness, there is one thing that we know for certain. We are not it. So the second thing I want you to know, you and I are desperately hungry. We're desperately hungry. Apostle Paul was quoting the Psalms when he said this, that no one is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks God. I want you to hear that again. Quoting the Psalms, Apostle Paul says that no one is righteous. That means as you look around this sanctuary this morning and you look at me, I know I'm wearing a robe. It doesn't matter. This is just covering all kinds of iniquity. <laughs> no one is righteous. None of us. And here's my question. Do you really believe that? Not because you know you're supposed to. Not because you've heard that verse before. But I mean experientially, in your life, practically. Do you feel that? That no one is righteous. That you are not right. That there's something not quite right with you. Well, how do we experience that? Well, we experience that in our righteousness before God. That our relationship between us and a holy God is broken. Why? Because we're not righteous. We're not right. We're not right because we are filled with sin. Later in Romans 3, Apostle Paul says that all have sinned fall short of the glory of God. That thing in you that feels not quite right, what is that thing? It is sin wreaking havoc in every part of who you are. And so we're not righteous before God, but we're also not righteous within ourselves. We feel that. As hard as we might try to be good, with all due respect to Greg Epstein, we cannot be good left to ourselves apart from God. We can't. And you will drive yourself crazy trying to do it. You can beat yourself up. You can shame yourself. You can try every form of human motivation, but you cannot be good on your own. And if you've ever tried to be and you were ever actually honest with yourself, you know how frustrating this actually is because we can't do it. But we're also 
unrighteousness in the world around us, that we contribute to this thing called humanity that is deeply broken and wounded. So much unrighteousness has been done to you. The truth is, just like me, you've done unrighteousness to other people. We are not righteous. We're not right. We're not right because we are sinful. And what I want you to know is that has left us desperately hungry. The idea of hunger is the idea of being desperate and being needy. To be truly hungry or thirsty means that if you don't get food or water soon, you will die. That is the kind of hunger and thirst that Jesus is talking about here in the Beatitudes. And I think as we read the Beatitudes, we have a tendency to make them moralistic. To think as if that Jesus is giving us this Beatitudes, telling us what we have to do in order to get his blessing. And so we read, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, and what we hear is this, blessed are those who are righteous. But that's not what Jesus says. He doesn't say blessed are those who are righteous. What does he say? Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. In other words, blessed are those who have so little righteousness who are so desperate, who are so lacking in righteousness before me that they are now blessed because I'm going to give them a feast. So the question for us this morning as we think and respond to this fourth beatitude is not, are you righteous enough for God's blessing? We already know the answer to that. (laughs) It's no. It's do you know just how desperately hungry you are? Because the truth is, there is a hunger down deep in us that you and I try to fill with so many other things. Because it's not just that we're not righteous, it's that we hate it. We hate righteousness. We don't have an appetite for it. Instead, we've cultivated an appetite for so many other things that are actually unrighteous. They're not right. They're not good for us. They're things that will destroy us. It's why we see over and over and over again the Bible equates sin with slavery. It's not just that this is, oh, breaking God's rules, but God gives us rules because he loves us. I've put it this way many times. We live on a very busy street, Macomas Boulevard. We've tried to petition the city of Dallas for speed humps on our side. They won't do it. I'm looking at you, Dallas. (laughs) People fly down our street. I have three little girls. What kind of father would I be if I didn't give them rules about the street? If I just said, you know what, do whatever you want. You don't have to tell mommy and daddy. Just run out in the street. That would not just be an apathetic father. That would be a terrible father. But no, we have strict rules about the street and where they are not to go. Why? Because I love them. God has given us righteous rules because he loves us. And yet we've developed an appetite for things that will destroy us and enslave us. And so Jesus says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst, not for unrighteous things, but for righteousness, for the righteousness that comes with the kingdom of God. And he doesn't say, blessed are those who are righteous. He says, no, blessed are those who are in need. Blessed are those who are desperate. Blessed are those who are starving who are depleted, who understand that there is nowhere else to go because he alone satisfies. That's the third and final thing I want you to know. Only the righteousness of Jesus will satisfy our greatest need. Jesus concludes his fourth beatitude, as he does with all the beatitudes, with a promise. It's not just blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, but he tells us what the blessing is. He says, they shall be satisfied. In other words, their hunger and their thirst will be fulfilled. That Jesus, in the midst of our desperation for righteousness, has set a feast on the table of grace. And he says, come and eat. 
come and drink. How does he satisfy us? How does this happen as people who might be hungry and thirsty for righteousness, who people who understand that there is nothing in us who is right, nothing in us that is good, that we are full of sin? How is it that Jesus satisfies us? He does it with the most unfair, ridiculous trade in all of history, and it's in our favor. He exchanged our sin for his righteousness. The doctrine is called the doctrine of imputation. Before your eyes glaze over, I want to tell you this morning as we end, why the doctrine of imputation is everything for us as believers in Jesus. And if you are not a Christian this morning, why? You desperately need it. It's the great exchange that on the cross, our sin was imputed to Jesus. And his righteousness was imputed to us. We actually spoke of those words in our confession of sin this morning. You can see them in your bulletin. Together, we confessed, you have imputed my sin to my substitute and have imputed his righteousness to my soul. Okay, well, what in the world does that mean? Well, we first come across the idea of imputation all the way back in Genesis chapter 15. When Abraham responded to the promises of God with faith, and this is what it says, and Abraham believed the Lord, and he counted it to him as righteousness. That word counted is the word for imputation. It means Abraham wasn't righteous. No, he would just like you and me was an ordinary man full of sin. But because he trusted in God's promises, God counted it to him as righteous. In other words, he imputed his own righteousness to Abraham and said, Abraham, you are not righteous because you deserve it. But through faith and by my grace, I'm now counting it to you as righteous. And I want you to notice something really clear here. Notice what it says. It says that Abraham believed the Lord. It doesn't say that Abraham believed in God. The last several years of evangelical Christianity, we've reduced faith to this idea that if you just believe in God, that he exists, then you will be saved. Well, even the demons believe in shudder, James tells us. That is not saving faith. No, saving faith is trusting God. It's answering the first question of the Bible put forward by Satan, did God really say And by faith saying, yes, he did. And he said yes and amen through the death and resurrection of Jesus. This is why the apostle Paul in the book of Romans says that this is how salvation works. Romans 4 verse 23, Paul says, but the words it was counted to him were not written for Abraham's sake alone, but for ours. It will be counted to us who believe in him, who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord, who delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. What is Paul saying? That we are saved through faith by the righteousness of Christ alone. Not ours, but through faith. Jesus took our sin in his body on the cross and in exchange gave us his own righteousness so that now before God, he would look down on us and not see our filthy rags and not see our sin, but to see the righteousness of his own son. That in the same way that he said, this is my son with whom I am well pleased, he now looks on you and me, not because of anything that we are, but only because of the righteousness of Jesus. He says, you are my daughter, you are my son, and in you I'm well pleased. But not only that, the righteousness of Jesus now dwells in us through the Holy Spirit. And so notice what Jesus says in the fourth beatitude, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. When does that hunger ever stop the side of heaven? Never. Never. 
One day when we get to heaven, we will be satisfied once and for all, but this side of heaven, we are desperate for the righteousness of Jesus every day, and here's the good news. Every day, Jesus sets out a feast for you and me so that the now through us, the righteousness of God would go to the world so that through his church, his bride, his ones who are now righteous in Jesus, all things would be made right again. Until that day comes, Jesus says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. So this morning, my question to you and me is this. What are you hungry for? Do you know just how desperate you are for the righteousness of God? That is where this story begins. That you would know that there is a hunger and a thirst that is far deeper than water or food that comes to you and me because we are desperate before God. But I also want you to know that Jesus has set a banquet by his grace and mercy. And so this morning, if that describes you this morning, if you hunger and thirst for righteousness, I want you to hear the gracious invitation of Jesus from the Gospel of John. Jesus said, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for this incredible trade that you've given us in Jesus Christ that you have taken our sin on Jesus and he died so much that we died with him and now you've given us his righteousness in exchange that we might now become the righteousness of God. Oh Lord, we feel the tension of those two things every single day and so we pray as we sing this final hymn and go from here that you by your spirit would work this righteousness in us. And I pray if there's anyone here this morning who has never known their true hunger and what it means to truly be unrighteous before you and that you are the one who grants righteousness through your son, would you stir in their heart and show them the banquet, the feast that has been set before them. Oh Lord, may we feast on you now as we sing, as we spend time with one together as as a family of God and as we work this week and labor and parent and love one another that we might embody the righteousness of Christ that has been imputed to us. We pray this in his strong name, amen. Let's stand, let's sing together.